Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all who joined us today from various parts of the world. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to the Institution of Mechanical Engineering members and non-members attending today's webinar. On behalf of the Aberdeen Area Committee, I would like to wish everyone uh, attending today's webinar prosperous year ahead, especially during the period of lockdown ahead of us. My name is Alexei Yazinski, and uh, I'm a volunteer for the uh, IMACI committee here in Aberdeen in Scotland. This is the first presentation broadcasted in 2021. And I wish all attendees and their families the best for the year ahead. Everybody who has registered for this event should have received an email which will give them admission to the recorded webinar. The webinar will also be saved on our iMakey YouTube channel for viewing at a later date. We ask you to type your questions into the question box available on the screen. At the end of the presentation, we will have some time to answer a selection of these questions. We will try to get through as many questions as possible. However, it may not be possible to answer all of them. Before I hand over to Stephen Cool, our presenter for today, please allow me to make a few words of introduction. Stephen Cool is a structural engineer with over 20 years of experience in structural integrity management, working at Acker, AMEC, Atkins, Clerk Maxwell, and currently with DNVGL. Stephen joined the structural integrity management team at DNVGL in 2012. He became team lead in 2017, managing the integration of the floating structures team into the SIM team to form the fixed and floating structures unit. Over the course of his career, Stephen has worked in all areas of structural integrity management, from structural analysis to inspection planning and management. Stephen's presentation today is titled Qualitative Risk-Based Inspection, Keeping It Simple. Over to you, Stephen. Perfect. Thank you very much for that introduction, Alexi. So I shall move on to the first slide. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's noon where I am. I'm sure it's different part, different times in different parts of the world. If you have to excuse me, it's noon for me here today. Uh, like Alex said, my name is Stephen Cool. Uh, I'm a structural engineer with DNVGL, and I work. Uh, I lead the fixed and floating structures team. We do a bunch of um, structural engineering and naval architecture type work. But today, I'm going to be speaking about qualitative risk-based inspection and how we think keeping it simple is the right thing and how we go about keeping it simple. So I'm going to start rather unusually with an apology. And, and that is that I have a slight mental block around the words quantitative and qualitative, um, which is strange for someone giving a presentation on this subject matter. But um, I occasionally switch the words around without meaning to. Um, it's because they're phonetically very similar. Um, so if you do hear what you think is the wrong word at any point, it's not your hearing. It's most likely that I said the wrong words. So I apologize if I create any confusion. So this, this is a story of how we develop a purely qualitative risk-based inspection methodology. And we had one simple goal. And that was to allow our very experienced engineers to make clear, consistent, and holistic decisions based on their judgment and experience. So I'm not presenting the system itself today. That's actually not very interesting. Um, I'm actually going to talk about some of the problems we faced when we were developing the system and how we solved some of those key challenges. 
So I'm a structural engineer, as uh, both myself and Alex have, Alex have pointed out. Um, so a lot of this presentation will be will be thinking about it in terms of developing a structural qualitative risk-based inspection methodology. However, what we, we strive to do is keep these things generic. Um, so I think the lessons that are learned here, that we've learned and that we're going to impart to yourselves, are valid for almost any type of component that you are assessing on a purely qualitative basis. So what is risk-based inspection? So I think I'm hoping most of the people listening to this presentation know a little bit about risk-based inspection and what it is. And so I'm not planning to give a long discussion about what risk-based inspection itself is, but I think it is useful to go over one or two of the key points in it to set the scene for the rest of the story. So if we had infinite time and infinite money and an infinite bed space, we'd probably inspect everything because that's the safest thing to do. Um, but the reality of the world we live in is that we don't have infinite time, infinite bed space and infinite money. So what we've got is so we've got a finite amount of resources to which we can throw at doing an inspection. So what we've got to do is make sure we use those resources in the best possible manner uh, and by focusing on inspecting things that present the greatest risk and that's what risk-based inspection is. Um, I'm hoping this, this slide is broadly familiar to most people. Um, you know, in risk-based inspection we are looking at threats and then once we know what the threat is um, we want to know what the risk is and we get risk is a function of both the consequence if that thing happens and the probability, how likely that thing is to happen. And once we know the risk, we can then take a decision about do we inspect it, how often we inspect it, and how much of the component we might want to inspect. I always think it's better to present things with examples because I find the examples work far better than demonstrating something. So I've got three examples here. Um, the first is fatigue on structural steel due to rotating equipment. Now that's something that in my 22 years of experience um, has been a conversation exactly twice and it's never actually been demonstrated to be a problem. So based on my experience, if fatigue on structural steel due to rotating equipment has got a low probability of occurring. Um, and what would be the consequence of that? Well, um, the thing with fatigue is it can lead to structural failure quite quickly before you notice it. And um, so, yeah, maybe limited structural failure. We're probably looking at a bit of secondary steel at, at the absolute worst and no threat to global integrity. So we, let's call that a medium. And if we take those two numbers or those two words, low and medium, and we put them into our risk matrix, we will get a, a low risk. Um, another example might be limited overload of tertiary steel. Now that's something that, that can occur and in my experience has happened. So let's, let's say that's a medium probability. Um, but the consequences of that are actually quite quite low because the worst you'll generally see, let, let's take, take for example, a container that's slightly too heavy going down on a lay down area or going down with slightly too much force. Uh, you're looking at limited damage to one or two tertiary members, a buckled flange, a buckled web, um, but probably no overall structural failure. So the consequences is quite low. So although we had slightly different probability consequence decisions, our overall risk to that event is still low. Then let's take something that's a bit more of a higher risk. So let's take a, a crane pedestal uh, and fatigue on a crane pedestal. So we know that fatigue happens through cyclic loading and we know that the crane pedestal will see cyclic loading. That's, that's a given if the, if the crane is being used. Um, so let's say the chance of that, probability of that happening on medium. You could argue medium, you could argue high on that one, but let's, let's call it medium. Um, and what's the consequences of a crane pedestal feeling? Well, Particularly with fatigue cracks, fatigue cracks don't always give you a lot of, lot of warning if, unless you're inspecting for them. Um, and the a pedestal is a single point of failure. So if you do get a crack in it, the fail the the pedestal can fail. So let's call that a high risk. And if you look at the matrix, you'd see how we got to that. Um, I think it, it's worth pointing out that. These sort of structured decisions that I just made there. Um, if, if you'd asked most structural engineers about the risk of these three things, they probably, without even giving those those thought processes, 
in framing it in a, an RBI sense, would probably have come to those same answers as well. So I thought it'd be useful to set out how a risk-based inspection, what the process for a risk-based inspection is. My apologies, I'm just taking a drink there. Um, we start off by determining what the critical components are and therefore what the threats to those components are. Now that's largely done in experience. Um, the safety case will point you in the direction of safety critical elements, um, but largely your experience and understanding of structures dictates that. Um, we then we go on to decide on the probability and the consequence, which is what we've just done in the previous slide, which determines the risk. And then we determine an inspection method and a suitable frequency. And again, we're using experience to do that latter part as well. So that's broadly the framework under which you do an RBI. Um, what we're focusing on today is how we make decisions about probability and consequence, because that, that's the part that requires a little bit of thought. It's experience comes into it, but it's how we use our experience to make those decisions. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Now's a good time to talk about quantitative and qualitative. Um, I think hopefully most people know what these words mean. Um, but when I was preparing this presentation, I thought I'll look them up in the dictionary and see what they actually mean. Um, just check I've got it right. Um, so for quantitative, the dictionary said related to measuring or measured by the quantity of something rather than its quality. And then for and why I would, you know, I, I, I'm a simple man and I would say using numbers. So what we're saying is we're using numbers, quant we're using quantities, we're using numbers to measure something. Um, qualitative is describing the quality of something in size, appearance, value, etc. Such adjectives can be submodified by words such as very and have comparative and superlative forms. So again, keeping it simple, it's using words. So one's using numbers. One's using words. Now, if given the chance, you should always, if you have the chance and you have a, a good quantitative system, you should use that. Because if, if you have good measured quantities, good numbers that you can, you can easily measure and record, and more importantly, good technical systems and, and procedures that deal with those quantities that and you can, you can get an inspection frequency out of that, that is so much better because that takes a lot of the judgment out of the process. Um, however, the problem is that particularly in, in my line of work, and that's a lot of what we do is top size type RBI, um, there aren't good quantitative systems. There, there isn't always quantitative data either. Um, there are, there are one or two good quantitative systems, but those are very focused on particular failure mechanisms and they're not particularly good for, for like I say, top sides. So we sway towards using a qualitative system. And what a qualitative system is, is, is actually allowing the engineer's judgment to flow through the process. So rather than putting numbers into an equation and getting another number out, we're asking an engineer to make a judgment about something and to present their judgment. Something I see quite a lot and I've got a particular soapbox about is the, the semi-quantitative approach, which I rather disparagingly refer to as the appearance of science. Um, I, I think a lot of time as engineers that we sometimes get a little bit nervous when we don't have a formula or a, um, a table to look up and things like that. Uh, and what we, what we then do is we then want to create something that's a bit more quantitative. So we create these what's called semi-quantitative systems. And th what I'm showing on my slide here isn't from any one system. I I've made this up, but it is indicative of what I have seen in, in systems in the past. Um, the, what tends to happen is you will get a series of factors that, that lead into both probability and consequence. And each of those factors will have a series of conditions, and each of those conditions have a value. And what you tend to find is that the values that attach to the conditions don't always have good, robust engineering science or technology behind them. They, they, they become 
they're more about people's opinions. But because we put numbers into it, we start to believe there's, there's this veneer of science in the system. And it, it's a slight falsehood. And um, we think it's better that you actually just go for a fully qualitative approach if you can't do a quantitative approach. So when would you use a fully qualitative approach? So it's, it's for when no quantitative data is available. So when you don't have data, and more importantly, you don't have the methodologies to process that data in a robust, sound way. Um, we like to avoid black boxes wherever possible. Um, black boxes tend to obscure the decision making. Um, they also tend to relieve sometimes the engineer of the responsibility for the decision making because they put the numbers in and the other numbers have come out, so it must be right. So we don't like black boxes because we think experience matters. We think that most engineers in, in, in this line of work will know what to inspect without actually having a black box to tell them. But what's important is that we have a, a framework for making these decisions. Because with, with risk-based inspection, every year, every three years, every five years, you've got to be coming back to it and you've got to be reassessing the decisions that you've made in the light of new information that's come along. And um, if you've inspected something a lot and inspected it frequently, and you're experiencing no problem, maybe that's an indicator that the risk that you thought was there isn't, and you should inspect it less. Now, if you want to come back and make those decisions, you've, you've or change those decisions, you've got to have recorded how those decisions were made. So we think there should be a framework for making decisions, but it should be a light touch framework. We should keep it simple. So I'm going to talk about the system we developed in terms of two iterations. Um, the first iteration where we set out our basic ideas, and then the second iteration where we try to sort of perfect them and get them right. Um, the, the reality is that actually there were probably three or four iterations of the system before we got to the point we're currently at. But it's easier for the narrative and the story today that we, we, we frame it in two iterations. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the main aim when we first put, pulled this system together was to achieve independent agreement. So what do I mean by that? If I was to take any two engineers and give them exactly the same data, and you know, say they had broadly the same experience, and put them in separate rooms and ask them to make a decision about something, they'd probably come to different decisions. And that is the nature of engineers. That's what engineers are like. Um, we we overanalyze things quite a lot. Um, but if I put two of those two engineers and put them in the same room, I would get the same answer. And it's not that either of them were wrong. It's their, their terms of reference for describing the, the problem might have been different. And therefore, their answers were framed very much in their own terms of reference. So when I put them together and butt their heads together a little bit, they'd probably come, and, come together and agree the same answer. Um, but that's not, that's not what I was after. I wasn't after a system where we'd get agreement eventually. I mean, what I wanted was a system where two different engineers on different days, maybe years apart on different projects, for the same input data, gave the same answer. So bear in mind, we've got a qualitative system, so judgment is a large part of it. So how do we get these guys or gals to give the same answer? And part of the problem that we, we sort of come across was, what does the words high, medium, and low actually mean? We use high, medium, and low a lot of times to describe um, probability and consequence. What do these words actually mean? Um, and that's what we try to tackle in the first iteration of the system. So what we did is we came up with a number of considerations for both um, probability and consequence. Uh, we, things, that we, things that we would like to consider, things that we'd like to think about when trying to determine what the probability and the consequence were. And for each of these, these categories, we came up with a, a series of benchmarks, a series of tables that gave benchmarks that that told you what high was, what medium was, and what low was. And it was to basically benchmark the decision. So the two engineers working independently and on different days were working off the same understanding of what high, medium, and low actually meant. So we did that for probability. Here's an example here. And we did the same one for consequence considerations as well. Now, that, that's the end of it, right? So we, we fixed it and we've got an RBI system that works well. Like most things, it didn't work first time around. Um, 
And I can recall sitting in a, a room with two other equal experienced engineers, and we were talking about an RBI assessment for an FPSO top side, and we were in particular we were talking about the the module stools. And everyone in the room, we're all experienced engineers, we all knew that the the, the problem that we're most worried about was fatigue and if we're going to get fatigue in, in any place in the module it was the stools so the stools should get an enhanced level of inspection now that was fine we knew the answer the problem was that we then tried to back work that answer into our considerations our set of our tables that we generated um, and we struggled a little bit to take out that knowledge that we had and push it into this um, into this system and that was the problem. That was never the intent. The, the intent was never that we were having to fudge the system to get the answer that we wanted. Um, it was that the system was not really working for us. So I said to I said to the guys, I said, "How do you make this better? You know, we've used it once now, once or twice, and it's not really working as we'd want it to. How do we make it better?" And there were sort of two sets of answers or two schools of thought that I got. Um, the first was let's make more of these categories, these 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 considerations, because they're quite generic, and maybe we need more of them to describe um, structures. Because the system has originally been designed for um, top size structures and fixed platforms, and we were using it for a whole bunch of other things. So maybe we need more generic categories. And um, the other school of thought said, well, actually, rather than being generic, maybe we should come up with some specific guidance for each element. So. For caissons, here's your, your high, medium, and low guidance and your considerations. For secondary steel, here's the guidance that you should use. And both of those response, both of those ideas elicited the same response from me, which was, oh no, not more tables. Because I felt the more tables and the more complexity we built into our system at the front end, the more freedom we'd rob from the engineer to make the right decisions. And it's, it's not about making it sense, it's putting the responsibility for the decision squarely in front of the engineer and not in, not in any system that's been developed. Because these systems are all reasonably generic and they can't foresee every possible outcome. So a word that I, I used earlier in my second or third slide was holistic. Um, I looked that up in the dictionary, I use it quite a lot. Uh, I looked up in the dictionary just to check I was actually using it properly. And and the the description of it is characterized by the belief that parts of something are intimately interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole. Now, taking that in in terms of the decisions that we were making, what I had was engineers making holistic decisions. They knew the answer, they knew from their from their experience. They knew what the risk level of that, what the probability, what the consequence of that was, and they went straight to D. And they were, we were then asking them to back work D into A, B, and C to to, to help to record the decision. Yeah, and that that wasn't working for us because it didn't feel natural. It it felt artificial and it felt unnecessary. Um, so these are the, the problems that we had that brought us to the second iteration of our system. Now, this is, this is, I guess, the meat of the presentation, if you like. Um, and I'm going to talk about four problems that we saw and how we tackled them. So the first problem was, how do we improve the system? Because it, it fundamentally, the system wasn't working for us. Um, it, it wasn't it didn't give us the freedom to make the decisions. It felt that we were we were work, we were working for the system rather than the system working for us. So what we did was we removed all the tables that we 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 wrote. Now this is actually around probability decisions. We we found that the con the tables that we had for the consequence decisions were far simpler to apply because I think there are only a finite there are a smaller number of consequences than there are ways to judge probability. So we, we kept the tables mostly for the consequence decisions, but for the probability decisions, we removed the tables. And we said, let's let, let's let the engineer just make a single holistic decision. Let's just let them tell us what the answer is, because they know the answer. But we still need a framework for this. 
yeah, like, like I touched on earlier on the presentation, we might have to come back and reassess these decisions. So we have to be able to record why we made these decisions in the first place. So we still need a framework. Um, but how, can we, how simple can we make this? That, that was the target we set ourselves. How simple can we make this while still being generic? That was the target. And quite frankly, spent quite a lot of time scratching my head about that one. Um, and I was going over lots of different ways and lots of bits of paper were thrown in the bin and post-it notes were thrown all over and everything. Um, and I eventually focused in on, I sort of stepped back from all the, all the, the mess and said, what actually are we doing here? Yeah. And what we're doing is we're looking for failure mechanisms so that we prevent structural failure, we prevent the outcome of the mechanism. But mechanisms don't happen on their own. Mechanisms have to be initiated. Uh, you know, and a good example of this is corrosion, is a fairly common uh, failure mechanism on structures. Um, what causes corrosion? Well, corrosion doesn't happen on its own. It's the environment that initiates that corrosion. Yeah, and then that leads to structural failure. But we don't design. We design structures not to fail. Yeah. So if we design structures not to fail, why are we having to inspect it? You know, if we've designed all this properly, it won't fail. Why are we having to inspect it? And the answer is, things change. So if you're if you're sitting um, at your your computer, or if you're a little if you're a little bit older, you can imagine yourself sitting at your drawing board, and you're designing your new platform you make a series of reasonable assumptions when you're designing it. Um, these are assumptions about maintenance, about loading, about, about any number of things. But these decisions are, these, these assumptions you make are entirely reasonable. And if we didn't make them, if we didn't make these set of reasonable assumptions, and we actually designed a structure with our most conservative left, you know, left field um, set of assumptions, then no structures would ever get built because everything would look like the fourth rail bridge, you know, a massive structure that's, that's never going to go anywhere. Um, but nothing would be economically viable at that point. So we would never get any platform down the North Sea. We'd never get any oil out. So we design things to a reasonable set of assumptions. But as soon as we take our, our shiny new fresh platform and, and dump it in the sea, um, real life hits it, you know. So maybe the maintenance that we were expecting isn't as good. Is, is what actually happens in real life, and there's a lot of reasonable reasons for that. Um, maybe the environment load that we've designed for is, isn't uh, changes. You know, now the environment doesn't change. The environment, you know, global warming aside, the environment doesn't change. It's our understanding of the environment that changes. So maybe our understanding of the environment and our predictions of the the hundred year and the ten thousand year wave they change. Um, you know, how many platforms? Currently, out in the North Sea, are in life extension. You know, a large, a large proportion. I would hazard a guess. And um, so the lifespan. You know, you design this platform for 25 years, and the operator wants to keep it in for 40 or 50 years. Um, so a lot of the assumptions you made way back when are no longer valid. Um, maybe there's maybe there's accidental damage. You know, and um, there's occasional accidental structural damage on, on offshore platforms. Um, that maybe changes the nature of the structure and how it acts. You know. Um, and we learn new stuff, we learn new knowledge, whether that's new codes or new industry practices or, or anything like that. Um, you know, and, you know, des designing, you know, reassessing old things, new codes, that's a whole subject for another day, so I'm not going to touch on that. But suffice to say, we, we learn new things. Um, and then maybe they put additional structures on, maybe there's a hang-off module or a new module goes on or something changes. All these real-life things change. So, so the assumptions that we had that that if it had all been met, nothing would have ever failed, those assumptions change. So with all these thoughts in mind about, you know, what changes when we design things, why do things fail, and all of that, um, we broke it down into four questions. And in our, in our methodology that we currently have, um, we, we've sort of codified that into a flowchart to make it slightly easier. Um, I've deliberately slightly obscured the flowchart there. 
so you can't read it. Uh, I'm sure anyone with the four questions could come up with a similar flow chart. That particular bit was not rocket science. Um, but th the question is, how likely is the initiative? So the first question we ask is, how likely is the initiative to occur? Yeah, because of course, it's the mechanism we're trying to detect. It's the initiator that starts it. If the initiator is not likely to occur, then the mechanism is not going to occur either. So we have to ask that question first. Uh, then we say, did we know about the mechanism when the component was designed? Yeah. So are we? So this this mechanism that we we may want to inspect against, did we design against it in the first place? Did we include that in our design philosophy? Um, if we did, are these design conditions still valid? Have things changed that invalidate those design assumptions? And if and if we have, if that has happened, and we put some additional mitigations in, um, are these effective as if as if they were originally designed in? Because a mitigation that's designed in at the start is always more effective than a mitigation that's added after the fact. Um, there's always some limitation you've got to meet when you're putting a mitigation in after the fact. That means they're, they're never quite as effective. So we so we use we use these four questions and nothing more to to to, to frame our decision about what is the probability of something happening. Um, and I think it's useful to show a couple of examples of that. I think examples always work better. So we'll start with the example of corrosion of top side secondary and tertiary steel. So is is the initiator likely to occur? Well, yes, it is. It's the offshore environment. It's the salty air. It's the seawater. Yes, it's going to happen. Um, did we know about it because it's originally designed? Well, we did. Corrosion. We've known about corrosion for for a good number of years. It's not a secret. Um, so we would have designed that in with an appropriate paint, paint spec at the time. Um, but the, the, are the design conditions still valid? So let's assume it's an older platform. Um, it's maybe not in great nick. So let's say, no, they're not. Let's say that it's been poor maintenance, and maybe it's been out there longer than we anticipated. Maybe it's at year 40 out of a 25-year projected life. Yeah, so the design conditions maybe not valid anymore. Um, and are the new mitigations as effective as if they were originally designed in? Well, what's your mitigation? Your mitigation is actually your maintenance, which we've, we've already decided it wasn't very good to get to that point in the first place. So the answer to that is no. So if we were to take those four questions and without even having that flow chart, just apply a bit of common sense to that, we'd probably decide that corrosion of top size secondary and tertiary steel has a high probability of occurring. Yeah. And I think even if you hadn't framed it in those questions, you would have still got to that answer. But what the questions do, the questions guide and record the thought making process. A second example would be overload of primary steel work. So is the initiator likely to occur? Well, yes. You know, in my experience, overload can happen. Um, well, can bigger than anticipated loads occur? I think it'd be fairer to say. So yes, bigger than anticipated loads can occur. Um, did we know about it at the design stage? Well, actually, we did. And uh, we didn't know what the the thing that would happen that would make the loads bigger than we expected to be. But we did know that it might happen because we designed factors of safety into both our loading and our um, component strength. Yeah, you know, and are these design conditions still valid? Well, let's say that they are. Let's say that the primary steel is well maintained and the load limits are reasonable with regard to how the the platform operates. Yeah. So, and then there would be no mitigations at that point. So what we could say is, although bigger than anticipated loads may occur. Actual overload of the primary steel, which has a low probability of occurring because there are these mitigations in place. And again, I think even without without these boxes to make these decisions, you would probably come up with that answer. So again, the boxes are just recording how you got there. So the second problem we came across is the meaning of words, and I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier in slides. What a high, medium, and low actually mean. And I've been very deliberate thus far in trying to keep to the words high, medium, and low when I'm describing probability. Because when we did iteration one, that's and consequence. Because when we did iteration one, that's kind of where we were. We were with high, medium, and low. So 
So if I was to, to ask the question, what is the probability you will get stopped at traffic lights or a junction on the drive to work? And I put two engineers in the same car. That's my little red Mazda there sitting in the traffic lights. Put two engineers in the same car and ask them to answer that on a high, medium or low basis. I would probably get two different answers. Yeah, I'd probably get high and medium, I suspect. I, would probably, I wouldn't get low, I'd get high and medium. And it goes back to the fact that there is no reference point for what high, medium and low actually mean with respect to that very specific question. However, if I were to actually just naturally answer that question, so I'm not being constrained to giving a high medium or low answer, and someone said to me, what's the probability you'll get stopped at the traffic lights or, or a junction on the drive to work, I'd, my answer would be it's likely I would get stopped, you know, if I wasn't working from home, that is, you know. And so notice I used the word likely. As soon as I use the word likely, I'm willing to, to bet that everyone that's listening to this presentation has an intrinsic feel for what likely means, yeah, with respect to, to that decision. Without, without setting a context for what likely means, without setting any baselines, we all know what likely means because we have a shared experience of the language and we use that language all day and every day and we know what these words mean without having to be told what these words mean or without having to set baselines for them. And that, that was kind of the, the trigger point. That was the, the, the light bulb moment, if you want. Um, so I ran off to um, a thesaurus, as it happens, um, and looked for um, synonyms for probability and consequence and found a whole bunch of words. Um, some of them were not appropriate. Some of them kind of fit the circumstances. Um, and I've picked out five or six of them for both probability and consequence here. And there were actually more words in the initial list. Um, and you, you'll note that I sort of ranked them in order on a sort of low, medium to high scale. Now, whilst there may be disagreement about the ordering of one or two words there, because some of the words have very similar meanings and it's, it's hard to differentiate between them. Um, I don't think if anyone was to come up with, with, with their own ordering, it would be fundamentally different to the ordering I've got here. And it is all because we have this shared experience in the language and we've been using these words all our lives. We know what they mean. So we, we, we decided to adopt natural language for describing these problems. So because it's, it's easier for, for an engineer to go, it's likely that corrosion will occur in secondary steel. That's a, a very natural statement. Uh, and if, if the words that we picked could fit into sentences, then the system was working. Um, you know, however, we are engineers and we wanted to create a little bit more robustness around it. So we, we did a couple of other things is that we, we uh, put some descriptions in and they just came out of dictionary. So likely means something that's almost certain to occur. And we pop some real world examples in. And it's 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 the, the car example, the commuter journey example that I used earlier. That example is is excellent because there are a range of probability level events that occur when you're driving the car, and there are a range of consequences that we can easily relate to from driving a car as well. The only thing we noted with these real world examples is they weren't great for um, probability. Um, when we use them for consequence, we had to do a little bit of mental baselining, if you like, because the idea with these real world examples, it would help the engineer mentally baseline the word. Um, so take the example of me running a red light in my, my car. That would have severe consequences for me, potentially. Um, I could kill somebody or somebody could kill me. Um, I could end up in the jail or lots of bad, lots of severe consequences for me personally if I run a red light, which is why we don't run red lights. Um, but if you look at what would be a severe consequence for a business, and businesses, you're taking a more societal view on things at that point, is something severe would be loss of a primary brace, for example, that led to loss of structure integrity at a platform that, as a minimum, you're looking at down manning um, or completely unmanning, or as a worst case scenario, you're looking at an actual accident where the platform falls into the sea. Now, both of those are severe consequences, but one is severe for me personally, and another is severe for society. And what we, we couldn't sort of codify up that difference, but what we did note in our methodology was the engineer, when using the real world examples, should understand that consequence requires context in a way that probability doesn't. 
Talking about consequence, we get to consequence escalation, and I think it's something that um, as structural, I don't know if other engineers are the same, but as structural engineers, we're awful good at. Um, we design thing, we design structures not to fail, and therefore we spend a lot of time talking about how they could fail. And sometimes it gives us an unnecessarily pessimistic view about structures. We, we always view them in terms of how things fail. So never go, never go around answers with a structural engineer because he'll point out to you the five ways which, this, which the roof could collapse. But we've got to rein that in a little bit. And because what we found, we, we found a problem um, of consequence escalation. So let's take two, two possible consequences, uh, or so two possible consequence escalations. So let's take a, a failed handrail connection. So severe corrosion in a, in a handrail um, connection. Um, someone trips and falls against it, you know, particularly big lad, let's say, um, and he's got sufficient force to be carrying something, he's got sufficient force to, to break the handrail, and he falls at the scene as a fatality. Yeah. Is that a reasonable escalation of the consequences? Yeah. I'll come back to that. So let's look at a fatigue crack on a pedestal. Yeah, fatigue cracks are much harder to spot until they, if you, unless you inspect, they're much harder to spot until you get get to having a problem with them. So continued use will cause the crack to grow, crane pedestals lack redundancy, it falls off into the sea, there's a fatality. So both of those events end up in a fatality. Now, if if we take our sort of darkest view of the world and every event ends in a fatality, we'll end up inspecting everything as a high consequence and therefore nothing gets ranked. Everything's going to, everything's ranked high, therefore there's no actual individual ranking within the what you inspect and there's no prioritization goes on. Now the whilst I think the pedestal is a reasonable escalation of the consequences. I think the handrail isn't. Yeah, I think that's an unreasonable escalation of the consequences. It's not a total total impossible scenario, but it starts to stretch the bounds of what is a reasonable um, escalation. You know, anyone who works for sure will tell you that if it got to that bad, if the barrier got to that bad, it would be barred off long before then. Um, you know, is there actually, you know, you have to be pretty big and carrying something pretty big to have enough force to actually break the handrail, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So the first one's an unreasonable escalation of consequences. The second is a reasonable escalation of consequences. And again, we couldn't codify that particular problem. All we could do is caution against um, caution against unnecessary consequence escalation and trust the judgment of the engineer when they're doing that. So the final problem is my matrix is bigger than yours. Um, anyone who's ever bought anything off the internet may well have been asked to fill in a survey about it at a later date. And you're probably presented with a picture like this, you know, a, a choice, a question. How likely are you to recommend super duper kitchen cleaning to your friends? And then asked to rate it one to ten. Now you're taking what is a quite a qualitative decision and trying to quantitatively define it. You can't use numbers to define what is a, a feeling effectively or a, or a judgment. And you know, me, you know, maybe you bought super duper kitchen cleaner. Um, maybe you quite like it. It's reasonably priced. It's not. It's not the best thing you've ever used. It's not the worst. Is it a seven? Is it an eight? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's these these options are they, they miss context, but more importantly, they're too closely spaced. There are too many of them, you know. And that is a phenomenon called overchoice or choice overload. Um, it's a cognitive impairment which we all have to a greater or lesser extent that says that we are faced we have a difficult time when we make decisions when there are too many options, especially when those options are too closely spaced and too similar. And that, that's a problem we have with risk matrices. Um, typically you find that the corporate risk matrix is um, usually five by five at least. And most customers want their corporate risk matrix to be reflected in the inspection methodology so they can see a direct link. And we push back very strongly on that. And we say, actually no, for this methodology, we have to keep to three levels of um, probability and likelihood, sorry, probability and consequence, because any more than three, and you have a great deal of trouble actually making a consistent decision 
and that's the thing a consistent decision because we want the decisions to be consistent we don't want the judgment we, we don't want opinions judgment sorry but we don't want opinions coming into that what we um what, what we have done with the customer is that we will align their risk matrix which is usually five by five to our three by three risk matrix to demonstrate that whilst we're using a core surf matrix it's still it still relates back to their original corporate matrix. <coughs> and it's interesting to just show an example of that. Um, this customer has probabilities in the range and consequences in the range of one to five and risk levels in the range one to four. Um, so the first thing we did is we looked at the risk levels and we found that their three and four for all intents and purposes was exactly the same, particularly within structural RBI. That, so, we, so we were able to easily get down to three levels of risk, which is the, the middle table there. And then what we did was using both the, the words that they, they had to describe probability and consequence and the words that we had, and a little bit of just best fit in the matrix, we, we, we fit their five scale to our three scale like this. And we found that 70% of the decisions gave the same answer. And the remaining 30 gave a slightly more conservative answer, sort of one, one risk level up, if you like. And we felt that was a reasonable sacrifice. It was reasonable to sacrifice that, that amount of accuracy so that we could get consistent decision making because actually that accuracy doesn't make any great deal of difference when you when you actually come to determining an inspection frequency and method anyway so you'll be pleased to hear we're, we're almost there um we, we finish off with the golden rule uh, and the golden rule is the engineer is always right so all the engineers who are currently listening today will agree with me. We're engineers and we're always right. What do I actually mean by that in the terms of RBI though? Uh, so although our system is quite light on process, we, try, we, don't, we don't want to be a black box. Although our system is quite light on process, we, there's still a little bit of process in there. And if we, put, if we follow that process and we get an answer that we don't agree with, what do we do? Yeah. Do we just accept that answer because our, our system said that's what it is? Absolutely not. You know, you might go back and think about it again, but if you're still happy that, that the answer the system's giving is wrong and you use the engineer are right, you stick with your answer. Yeah. So the temptation is usually to go back and fudge the system, is to change some of the inputs to get the answer that you want. And that's absolutely not the thing that you should do. That's absolutely wrong. Um, because when you come back to it five years from now or a year from now and you want to understand why you made a decision, if you fudge the answers, then you haven't actually given truthful answers as to how you got there. So what we do is that we simply say the system's wrong and we're overriding it. So we do that all in a spreadsheet with a little box that you tick that says, do you agree with the answer? If you agree with it, fine, we all go on. If you don't agree with it, you don't tick the box and you simply say, I'm overriding it. The reason I'm doing it is this and you give your reasons and the new, the new risk level is this, the new inspection frequency is this. Um, because it's important that the, the judgment and skill of the engineer should always outweigh the system because the system is just words on a bit of paper and doesn't know the, the great variety of things that the engineer is going to, going to encounter. And that's particularly an issue for structural engineers because every structure is different. So to summarize all that, why are we using purely qualitative methods. Why, why would we use them? Yeah, Because I said right at the start, um, quantitative methods is always better if you have it. Well, there aren't a lot of quantitative methods available for structures, maybe for other disciplines, that, that, that's different. Um, but we want, to, we want to avoid the appearance of science. If we don't have a quantitative method that we can use, and we're going to go qualitative, we want to go pure qualitative. We don't want to create a semi-quantitative one that has the appearance of science. It creates this idea that there's a black box because that removes from the engineer a slight responsibility for the judgment making process. And that's what's important is that the engineer's experience shines through all of this, which is why when we're doing it, we always do this with experienced engineers. This is not work for graduates. This is work for guys who know how a structure works and know how a structure fails. So how do we keep it simple? Because that, that was the title. That's what we promised was we keep it simple. Well, we kept it simple by doing three things. It was embracing the fact we were making holistic decisions, not trying to take 
five or six or seven micro decisions that feed into one that give you an answer. Very much trying to get to the answer directly. Um, but making sure we record that, I, I, I've touched on that quite a few times through this, this presentation, making sure we record how the decision was made, because that for us is really important. When you're going for a holistic decision, you've got to record how it was made, the, the thought process that got you there. And the other thing was, and that was, it was a light bulb moment in this, was that base, using the right baselines for terminology. Um, we, we came up with what we, what we felt was a good one with using natural language to describe this. Um, but it's having those baselines so that the terminology is agreed and understood between different engineers on different days um, so that you get a consistent approach. So that's everything that I have to say. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen. I'm going to pass back to Alexi now, who I think is doing questions. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for your informative and enjoyable presentation. Um, it is now time to look at uh, some of the questions received from our audience. So I'll start with the first question. Um, with regards to the risk matrix, do you use addition or multiplication to rank the hazard? Um, Over to you, Stephen. Yes, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the context of that um, question is, but I think the answer would be multiplication. Um, but I think the point is we don't use numbers, so we, we don't. It, it is a purely qualitative system, so that there's no numbers. So there's no actual. There's actually any arithmetic operations involved in this this process. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question. Is there a source that doesn't rely on experience to assign, say, probability or consequence to quantify the risk? There is for some um, for some components. There is. So, if you were looking at fatigue on jacket structures or hull structures, um, DNV RPC two one zero gives you probab probabilistic methods for inspection frequency planning um, that, to a large extent, don't rely on experience. They rely on hard numbers going in. And um, there's a similar one, I don't know if it's been codified yet, that looks at corrosion on, on tanks and looks at the examples of tank entry and the cost of tank entry. And so so the, these, these ones rely on you feeding numbers into a system. Um, and those, those are good. But the problem with, and I'll, I'll go back to topside structures because I'm most familiar with, is that there's such a variety of structural forms and ways that structural structures can fail and such like that the experience matters. It really does. I think as a structural engineer, you need to understand why things are failing. So there are limited circumstances where you can do it without experience, but mostly um, so there isn't good um, quantitative data, you have to fall back on experience. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll read out the next question. In order to rely so much on the judgment of the engineers, how do you assure yourselves that they are SQEP for the task? At what point, time, experience, courses, etc., along the graduate to 40 years experience journey, do you deem them SQEP? SQEP is an abbreviation. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what SQEP means, but you know, how do we judge competence? I think the question is. Um, hmm. That's an organisational issue. Um, you know, we as an organisation have ways to judge competence. Uh, and the key one is that we have we have competent people in leadership positions who can who can decide, and it, it goes for any piece of work, not just inspection. It goes for any piece of work that we can decide that that individual is competent to do that work. But it's worth noting as well, in, in, inspection 
the same as doing office work, for example, isn't a one-man job. Um, you know, in regards to the type of work you're doing, there will always be a QA process. There will always be a second engineer involved, a second set of eyes, and it's the combination of the two that will, will give you your final answer. But I mean, how, how do you judge experience? To answer the question. It's, that's more of a corporate question. That's more of a, a, a corporate framework, if you like. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Another question. Um, in your opinion, who should be part of the risk assessment team? What should be the ideal size of the review team? Excellent question. You know something? I would, um, it's almost like I wrote that question myself, but I can assure you I didn't. Um, we, we've a, a strong opinion that this work should not be done in isolation. Um, and and we, we push our customers very much towards running risk workshops. Um, so what we would typically do is we would typically go through the initial risk assessment process, and we, we usually have a number of questions, things that we're not certain about, because we we don't we don't work on the platform, we're not, we're not physically out there. Um, so what we do is then we, we go to the customer and we try as far as possible try to arrange a um, risk workshop. That that would typically be um, the customer's structural technical authority because they they've got the best onshore view of the structure. A um, couple of people from our team, uh, and then you, you, in an ideal world, you would have the um, the offshore inspection engineer because because they have a good feel for um, what would you know what the problems are on the platform, and if possible, people from the inspection team as well because a lot of the time, uh, the people from the inspection team, they understand issues about access that are not apparent from sitting in an office. So having someone who, who's actually involved in doing the inspection, we find of great value because they can tell you what's feasible and what's not. And sometimes you've got to rearrange your approach based on, on their input. So so, so that, that would be the group of people. So you're probably talking a group of maybe, if, if you do a workshop, a group of maybe four or five people. Thank you, Stephen. Uh we have just received the explanation of the, the abbreviation with reference to the previous question. Um, so SQEP means suitably qualified and experienced personnel. And uh, um, it, it um, comes from the nuclear industry. Ah, OK, yeah. Um, I, I guess the, there is no, certainly for, for structures, there is no formal qualification that says you are, are um, suitably qualified for doing this. It is it is more um, an organisational thing, you know. Your organisation should manage and judge your competency. So it's, it's more about the individual organisation doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question: um, Have you found many examples uh, where you lose vital details by making the scale coarser? Uh, not really, no. Uh, and the reason is that although the scale is coarser. The, the actual set of outcomes that you have from it is, is reasonably coarse as well. Um, when, when you're doing structural inspections, you don't want to have, you know, things that are expected annually, every two years, every three years, every four years, every five years, because, you, you know, you'll always have somebody out inspecting something. So you tend to coarsen up your 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 inspection regimes, if you like. And a lot of time, you know, without going into too many details, there's only really what, two or three options in terms of inspection regime. So the actual answer that comes out is quite coarse anyway. So actually coarsening up the, the inputs makes no difference. And the, the, the consistency in decision making, it, it, it provides far outweighs any downside. OK, thank you, Stephen. Uh, next question is, how easy is to convince client organization that the qualitative approach is sound? Many organizations seem to be drawn towards the semi-quantitative appearance yeah. of science approaches. Is it a problem you often encounter? Actually not, no. Um, and I think the reason is we, we start on the basis that we're very open about what we're doing. Um, you know, we're not, and what we, what we what we sell to customers is is, is clarity, is, is 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 clearness, if you like. Um, these semi these semi quantitative approaches have, have a black box, and 
the, the, the people who have to look at the decisions, you know, the structural TA who has to look at the, the work that we've done won't always follow the decisions. Whereas if we open it up and say, actually, we're just going to document our decisions and keep it really clear, they actually, they love that. They think it's much better than, than black boxes. We've had some very positive feedback on using this. But again, it's important that that we've we've we presented it in a way that we explain the benefits of it. Um, thank you, Stephen, for answering uh, the questions. Unfortunately, uh, the time is up for the questions, and um, would like to say a big thank you to you for presenting this webinar and answering all the questions professionally. And I thank. Uh, all participants for joining from around the world and asking the questions. I would like to take a few more minutes to take to make some announcements about our future events. Um, as you can see on the slides, our next event is online webinar Mooring Integrity Management, Preventing Mooring Line Failures. The will be on 10th of February, uh, starting at the uh, afternoon, 12 o'clock, and uh, will be presented by Alex Argyros, lead naval architect, fixed and floating structures at DNVGL. The presentation will expand on the key principles in the upcoming DNVGL mooring integrity management, recommended practice which is expected to be issued in 2021 and is intended to help mooring designers and floating platform operators in oil and gas or uh, wind industries to improve the reliability, availability and safety of the mooring systems, whilst creating the potential to reduce inspection costs over the life cycle of their assets. In March, we have an online conference titled Hot and Cold, Assuring Fit for Purpose Joints Welded and Non-Welded Connections. The conference is jointly organized by the Aberdeen sections of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and the Society of Petroleum Engineers. It will take place in the mornings of Wednesday and Thursday, the 3rd and the 4th of March, 2021. The aim of this conference is to share knowledge and experience of different types of hot and cold connections, including what to look out for to equip engineers working at all levels to be able to ensure joints are fit for purpose. It will address the pitfalls and provide tips and important things to watch out for upfront, during installation, and throughout the life of the joint. This conference will provide a forum for discussing the issues with subject matters experts, leaving you with ideas to consider and workable solutions. You can register at the address shown, on, shown or by scanning the QR code will take you right to the registration webpage. Conference sponsoring opportunities are also available. Sponsoring this event will ensure your logo is prominently positioned across all promotional materials. Society of Petroleum Engineers and the Institution of Mechanical Engineers are not for profit organizations. All surplus funds raised will be invested into various initiatives to help support our future generation of young engineers. The next event The next event after the conference will be our membership surgeries. Uh, the surgeries will provide guidance on becoming professionally registered or upgrading your membership. There will be a 30-minute one-to-one session with a business development team member, and this will involve a phone call or video chat. The surgeries take place on Tuesday 9th of February from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Sign up on the iMeKey website at the address shown or by scanning the QR code.
And don't forget to keep checking our IMAQ near you Aberdeen area website for additional events as they become available. You can also find us on LinkedIn at IMAQ Aberdeen area. Click the follow button to get us into the news feed. You can see the the front page of our LinkedIn uh, profile here on the screen. So thank you, and uh, uh, thank you on behalf of the IMAQ Aberdeen Area Committee. These and other webinars will be saved on the IMAQ YouTube channel, which you will hopefully be able to access in the future. Don't forget to follow our social media platforms for the latest information about webinars, conferences, training, and other news. I'd like to thank Stephen again for presenting at this webinar today and for all our participants joining in. We look forward to seeing you again at our future events. Please follow up on our announcements. Thank you and goodbye.